Hey guys, good morning. <clears throat> I want to thank you all for coming out. Um, you know, it means a lot to have you all here for this moment. Uh, it's definitely hard to believe that this day has come. But after a lot of thinking and praying over the last several months, uh, today I announced my retirement from racing professional supercross and motocross. This decision has not been an easy one. Uh, my whole racing career has been a blessing. Racing started out as something my brothers and I did for fun. Back then I never dreamed I could make a living racing dirt bikes. Even if I thought I could, no one would have expected a kid from Minnesota to make it. I'll never forget that moment when I saw Supercross on TV for the first time. That moment sparked something in me, and all of a sudden I knew I wanted to be a professional Supercross racer. Dungy household was a little crazy with us three boys. They're rambunctious. Like I was always the mom where the kids were jumping off something, and you know, like what's wrong with this lady? Can't she keep control of her children? And there's always hell breaking loose. Yeah, growing up, I mean, I was always you know with Ryan and Jade, kind of like the little stuntmen, so to speak. You know, they would send me off if we built a jump at my grandpa's house, you know, on a BMX bike. We messed around, got in trouble, and kind of little shits really, and. Uh... Yeah, just, just like any normal kids growing up, really. We tried a lot of other activities, even the winter stuff, snowboarding, and it was just the dirt bike that always stuck. When you look in the vault for Loretta Lynn's, there's actually four Dungies from Minnesota. You know, they were, they were a family of racers. I got into dirt bikes from my dad. Uh, he grew up doing it. Well, I quit uh, probably in 83, 84. And then we had the kids, and then when they were five and six, we just got them some little bikes, little PWs. You know, here we get all dirt bikes, dad takes us to the races, and it was so cool to see dad's passion for racing too. With him being into it as he was, I was really young when I realized, like, that's what I want to do. Yeah, there was a lot of struggles. Um, I didn't want to go, and she kept saying, yeah, you need to take the kids to the races, you know, to the big nationals. And you go to the nationals, it's, you know, 800 miles from where we were, so you, you know, you're thinking about thousand bucks in fuel. Each class is like 130 bucks and each of us were racing four or five classes and then we each had two or three bikes. Maxed the credit cards out and sold the house, paid off the credit cards, used the company credit card on motors. And Not knowing then, but mom and dad, they were barely making the house payments and, and car payments. So if it wasn't for them, we kind of wouldn't be where we're at. It weighed on me in a good way because when I was 13, I realized that if I didn't turn pro, then here's mom and dad with you know this debt and it wasn't good. So in a way, it, it was um, just financially kind of heavy. Our little brother is actually faster out of all of us, and he was kind of the reason why we got a lot of the support. In my position as amateur team manager, most of the time, you know, you'd be at the big amateur nationals, and you know, certain kids would stand out. And so uh, we got down to Loretta's in 2004. Basically, I was focused on Blake. I was in the 50 and 65 classes, and obviously Suzuki, they had their, their 65. And so I got to talking with Michelle Ryan's mom at the time. I was working for Answer Racing and Pro Taper, and. Uh, She's, it was all a family thing. That was the first thing from the beginning. It's like, do you either sponsor all three kids or you don't sponsor us? I kind of drew the line in the stand. Like, if one's gonna race, all three are gonna race. So I said, I'm into that. I really like the whole family atmosphere thing. That's really where I came from, so. My little brother, Blake, actually, he got an A ride for Suzuki, which is free bikes, all these parts. A lot of good stuff comes with it. So that, that could help my parents out a lot. We started putting a program together for him for the next year, for 2005. And I think immediately Blake got hurt and kind of opened up some budget for Ryan. 
My plan for him was schoolboy in 05, B in 06, and then A in 07. I think Ryan, you know, he just turned 15 at the uh, Texas Nationals. Uh, something happened. This kid Ryan Dungey, you know, showed up, and uh, he, that was his coming out party. I was still young, so when, when my grandmother passed, I mean, obviously I, I knew what had happened, but, you know, I was kind of, my memories were a little faded of her growing up just because I was so young. You know, I was more concerned. We'd go over to her house and I'd, I'd play with toys 24-7 where it was, it was Ryan and Jade, you know, helping them put Christmas lights up, helping them rake leaves. And so, um, you know, I think once my grandmother did, did pass, I mean, that was really, that, that's when it all started to kind of change for Ryan in, in, a, in a positive way. And We lived right across the street from my mom and dad when all this happened. He would go over there and he'd see her laying on the couch and we'd have to give her a bath and just seeing how tough it was. And it was, it changed me forever and, and I don't know for particular why. I mean, I feel like I was scared of everything. You know, I'm sitting here on the gate and I was thinking of my grandma and I just got so mad and angry and I just, just almost like I'm gonna take it out on the track. And I always like my bikes to look a certain way. And he asked if he could put a sticker that was like grandma. It's more than just a sticker. It feels like she's actually out there with him. Finally, it came time to race, and, and I remember I just took off from the gate, just like, just pissed, and I, I uh, got the whole shot, you know, led every lap and won my first amateur race. Well, Team Dungey, we want to congratulate you. There's your champion, 125 B-Star. From there, it was, you know, of course, he was one of my number one guys after that. It was really unique to see that switch that flipped in him. You could tell it from his motivation, from his personality. I mean, when it came to, to doing work, I mean, he was, he was focused on the goal, and you got that first little glimpse of what could be. And then right after that, that very next week, and we go to Millville for that pro national to watch. We were walking through the pits and my dad, he's like, yeah, go, go up to Roger and tell him you look forward to riding for him one day. Ryan came and talked to us at uh, one of the nationals and his dad was like 10 steps behind him and it's just, hey, go, go talk to Roger, you know. And I told him that. I said, Roger, I, look, I, I just want you to know that I'm working hard and I look forward to riding for you one day. And he kind of gives that smirk. If anybody knows him, he's like, oh, really? You know, like, all right, cool. Yeah, and I said, oh, hey, this seems to be a nice kid, you know. And So then I get approached by this company, which is a privateer team. It, it was uh, WBR. And uh, so here's Vegas the next week. We go to Vegas. They flew us to Vegas just to watch, you know, and it was that was the year Carmichael and James and Chad, they were all within like five points. We're walking through the pits again. We see Roger and I said to him, I said, Rog, I don't want to be paid any money. I don't have to be paid any money. I just want that opportunity to have the best equipment and then we'll build from there, you know, give me a, give me a chance. I had a relationship with Roger DeCoster um, just from um, running the pro taper side of the business. I was there, Troy was there, and he's like, hey, we're gonna sign a deal with Williams Brothers, WBR. I said, Troy, do not do that. I'm talking to Roger. I think we can get Ryan a, a, a test ride. So anyway, what happened was Brock Kepler was hurt, and there was just a, that RMZ250 sitting idle. Roger said, yes, we're gonna be out at Glen Helen um, next week. Bring him out and we'll, we'll see what he does, and we got this bike, so it's, it's no problem. Four days later, he lines up a test for us at Glen Helen, and Ricky Carmichael's there. Ryan shows up at this test. We busy testing with Ricky. We're going through pipes and all kinds of other things, getting ready. And Hepler's bike, number 60, is just sitting there waiting for Ryan, and he went out there and he just ripped it. He did not look really fast, but his lap time was good. And one thing that stuck out to me was how long he rode for. This guy was doing motos. You know, I must have did like four 30-minute motos that day, just ripped in and... I noticed that, you know, he came off the bike and he could talk like normal right away and he was not winded or anything and I thought, oh, this is interesting, you know. And Roger's like, all right, we're, uh, I like what I see. We're gonna put together a two-year deal for you. Right there, right there and then and... But when Roger DeCoster signed him, he was looking for a replacement for Ricky Carmichael, but out of all the kids that he picked, Ryan Dungey was not at the top of anyone's list, and it caused quite a stir. There, I'm a journalist, and I was just like, who? All these people were just speculating, like, what is Roger DeCosta doing? He's an idiot. Like, you can't take a guy out of the B class and put him on a track. There's no way you can do that. I don't think that uh, Roger, Ryan, Suzuki, and ultimately KTM would have any idea of, of the dividends that that long shot would pay. And then he came on board and um, he was in with the big guys. You know, he had Ivan Tedesco and Ricky and he was just like this young pup 
with big eyes looking at this whole operation. His first race was at Millville, which is maybe in August of that year. I remember it rained that day and it was super, super muddy. Ryan's great in the mud. I mean, he's really good with the clutch. And I think he went 7.8 or 7.7 for seventh overall that day. After Millville, people were like, wow, he's real. You must remember when you're watching guys like Carmichael and Ivan prepare for Supercross, he was a, a little ways off. So what was surprising was how quick he learned from them. And, and he was like a, a sponge, truly. And then his first Supercross, he's number 62, he's racing the Georgia Dome, and he goes out and wins. He's gonna be a big star this season, one we'll be talking a lot about. Ryan Dungey wins in Atlanta. The opening round of the M Mobile Supercross Lights East Coast season goes to young Ryan Dungey. Right then, it just sort of began. I just was like on cloud nine. Then it was like, now here comes the learning process, you know, how to handle this situation, championships position, how to win a race, how to back it up. I didn't manage it all the best. I mean, at 17 years old, you only know so much. You know, my mom and dad were trying to help me with the finances and there was fights over all these things. And I mean, I, I by no means was an angel. Like I was pretty rude. At the time, I'm thinking, I wish I didn't have to go through this, you know, with the battle with Lawrence. J-Law was like this, this talent and charisma vampire. Anyone he got around, he'd ruin them. Ryan wouldn't play that game. He was like, I'm gonna beat that guy if I have to pick my bike up and throw it at him. He had gone through his challenges with Jason Lawrence and a couple of those other guys, and he had showed a lot of speed. He was very, very consistent, but he wasn't a winner in the outdoors yet, you know? and we went to Washougal and he finally won the overall and then you could see the change in his demeanor he believed that he could do it so then I knew okay now now he's made a real breakthrough now he's on his way so 2008 I finally at the end of the year I had it physically together mentally together there was a big change I moved up to Tallahassee started riding with Ricky at his compound he was great to have around uh, just his positive attitude and the guy never would do less never would do less and for the other guys that were here he had such a positive impact on because of his attitude so it was fun it was fun to have a teammate that was younger than me chase each other around the test track and you know do all the things that it takes to win those races every single week during practice the guy would lay it all on the line his determination is is second to none i've never seen anything like it I really respected that about him. The one thing that I think I really enjoyed the most, and it's a good thing to love about it because it creates more longevity, but was the practice track. When the practice days would come, it was like whether it was motos, whether it was sprints, sections, it was you against the clock. I love that process of trying to get better. You could see right, right, right from the beginning, there was nothing else on his mind but to be the best he could be. I'm sure that Ryan Villapoto, I'm sure that James Stewart, Chad Reed, all those guys work hard, but Ryan worked harder. And when he lost, you knew that it meant something to him. And I mean, he would be heartbroken. He's mad if he gets second place. It's not, it's, he, he wants to win all the time. A lot of athletes, if they get beat, they're like, oh, I'll, I'll get him next time. Well, he, he would get pissed, like go home and shoot you and talk to him for a couple days because he's pretty pissed off. Just them 250 days, how happy we were when he got like a fifth overall, a fourth overall. And now today, if you don't win or get second, it's pretty quiet going to the airport, you know? There's a lot of people that Ryan talks to that I know he really values their input. I mean, from guys like Jimmy Johnson to Ricky Stenhouse, like just other people who are in racing situations. Over the years of building a friendship with Ryan, it's been fun to engage with him and build a friendship on, on a very deep level that really only two guys that are in that moment can talk about. Even if he's racing on the weekend, he was always texting me saying, hey, good luck this weekend, go get it. I mean, he's paying attention to my races. I feel like more than he was paying attention to his, and, and that was always neat. Also started with the Fox racing crew that year, so I felt like I belonged, I felt good. You know, I think when you think about Ryan and you think about Fox and you think about like, consistent winning and consistent performing and that's really what we want consumers to think about when they think about Fox is that it's going to perform every time and shit that's Ryan. Ryan performs every time. 2009 is when he kind of had his first like legit season. It was a long season. It was very mentally draining and tough. The Supercross season was tough in itself and it came down to the last round but I was able to clinch my first championship. The champion for 2009 on the West Coast Tour is Ryan Dungey. Redemption time for the Rockstar Nikita Suzuki Ryan.
Ryder as he makes up for losing the title a year ago. He has done it. Ryan Dungey can take a huge sigh of relief as he has won the 2009 Monster Energy AMA Supercross Lights West Coast Championship. And then the outdoors is another hard fought championship battle, but we won the outdoor title as well. And here comes the Des Nations. I decided to go to the 450 class. Nobody thought we were going to win. They called us a B team. My season's already at the best I think it can be. But Ryan Dungey then comes through the rhythm section, doesn't look over his shoulder. He knows exactly what he's going to do. He's going to take the checkered flag here in the final motor of the day. He's won the race, but he doesn't realize that Team USA are about to win their fifth motocross of nations in a row. We win the Des Nations and it was just like, I was on cloud nine. I was just excited. It was the best season. I mean, it came pretty quick. We come off the 2009 into 2010. I'm bump up to the 450 now. I'm in the height of the class. Uh, we went on to win six races that year and then the championship in Supercross. Ryan Dungey has done it! The rookie is the champ! The Monster Energy AMA Supercross FIM World Championship belongs to Ryan Dungey. And we won 10 out of the 12 outdoor races and won the championship. And then we go to Des Nations in Colorado. It was in the U.S., you know, this is the Olympics of our sport, right? And we win. So within that two-year period, it was just like on a high level of just excitement. And But then pretty soon I was, I was to another huge learning curve was, was to come. It was at Southwick, and he had wrapped up the title. And then came the hardest part, was to tell Ryan. You know, Roger and Ian said, hey, uh, you know, we want to talk to you really quick. So they brought me in the motorhome. And we went into his bus, and we told him. They're like, yeah, we, we uh, so there's no easy way to t say this, and we're really happy for you, but we're going to KTM next year. We had told Ryan that we were going to leave, and he, of course, he was bummed out. It was like someone sucked all the wind out of the sails. You could just tell he was devastated, you know? Bear in mind, I have another year of uh, my contract with Suzuki for 2011. That year was so stressful and so hectic. I learned how to worry that year. 2011 Southwick National, there's a hurricane coming in. His bike breaks, they can't get it started. He's pacing around behind the starting gate. His mom is freaking out. Race goes off and all of a sudden, here comes Ryan Dungey's bike ripping down the hill. The pack is halfway around the track. Ryan jumps on the bike. The starting gate's already up. He has to go around the starting gate. Had he not gotten on the track before the leader passed the finish line, he would have been disqualified. There's probably dozens of rides of Ryan Dungey's life that end first, second, third, whatever. This one ends seventh. But it truly was epic. He, he salvaged his shot at the title. It was a thing of beauty. Brett Metcalf wins. Everyone's happy. And uh, I always remember that. You know, we always remember the races guys like Ryan Dungey win, but, but I've been lucky enough to be around some of the ones that he lost and uh, he never let you down. He always acted with the grace of a champion. So yeah, so 2012 come rolling around and just as we discussed about a year before that, that yeah, so my contract's up and I'm gonna go to KTM. Going from Suzuki to KTM when he did was a, you know, a career suicide and it was a ballsy move. It wasn't easy. He was not the easiest guy to work with in, in many ways. He could not make up his mind or would go back and forth and back and forth. Me and Roger were at each other. There was some little things with the bike that I, I couldn't figure out. He wants to make sure that we don't leave anything on the table. Setting wise, performance-wise, whatever it takes. That way you go to the main event or go to the heat to qualify and say, I have the best. We didn't have any DNFs or mechanical failures and we won the 2012 Outdoor Championship right away. Making that change, so many people doubted him. So many people said he's never gonna win on this bike and then to win a championship on it was a really cool moment. Anyway, and then there was the suicide shift. You know, I was, that was stupid, I don't know, I just. Ryan was the toughest when things went wrong. He was so good at limiting the damage that, uh, and that's why he won many championships. Monster Cup, when the, the shifter got bent and he could not get his foot under anymore because it was wrapped around the footrest. And he was shifting in the jumps with his hand and uh, he finished second, you know. When he was racing, anything could happen in the bike. He'll remount and go back at it and give it 100%. You know, some guys and the throttle's off or something's not right, they ride off the track. I've never seen Ryan do that. And 
he can take a bike that nobody else can get top three in, and he can do it. He'll make it work. And the attitude, never quitting, that's big. He never quit. To me, that's better than a title. It doesn't matter if he finished last, but you knew when he was on the track, it was 100%. He always races to the finish, always. Now, now it's 2015. We have a brand new bike. Um, there was a lot of great things happening this year. I started working with Alden Baker. To find a guy that would be dedicated from his nutrition to the strength training, to the cardio, to the track, to his bike setup, to his gear, to his resting program, even after he had left the facility, it, it was impeccable. I mean, the guy definitely analyzed every solitary area in order to do the job the best that he could. It took all the guesswork out of my program. I went to every race knowing that, like, I'm doing all that I can. There is nothing more that I can do. And I believe that there was nobody doing anything better than the way we were doing it, you know? So just in return, it brought confidence out on the racetrack. It brought confidence to my bike setup and myself. It had just allowed me to go out there and execute and do my job the best that I can and hoping that was going to be a win that night. We'd get some podiums, we'd get some consistent finishes. i win my first race by round five and then um, would go on to win eight more and win the Supercross title. That was the, the first Supercross title for KTM. The attention to detail and, and how on a moto guy has to be, that just takes a toll. There's an element that it's non-stop risk. I think the very successful riders will leave at a relatively young age, just due to the workload that they have to sustain. For the amount of years that, that Ryan has been doing it and how well he's done at it, it's incredible that he's been that consistent without much of a break. I'd say you know, when he got injured in during the outdoor season, I think it was last year, so 2016, not many people really knew the extent of the injury and the result of what could have been. When I was getting all the x-rays and the checkups and we were sitting with the doctor and I couldn't even move my neck and it was so painful, you know, and here comes the doctor and he said, if the rotation of your neck would have went any more, you know, you end up paralyzed. Pretty soon after that, we booked a flight up to Minnesota and we we're going to spend like a couple months here and just take it all in and understand what's happening. He had broken his neck. We were home and I can tell you, like, he did not want to come back. He didn't want to do this season. He was going to call everybody and be like, this is it. I call Eldon over to the house. I said, Eldon, I'm like 100% in shape. I'm ready to go. My mind's just not in it, you know? And I said, I, I think it's time. I need to be done. I don't want to, I shouldn't do this season. And he looks at me, he's like, well, what about if we just get through Supercross? What about that? Let's get through January into February when we come back to the East Coast. Let's see where we at, analyze it then. And uh, so I would do that, we talk, and I say, all right. I decided that I'm, I'm making a decision based out of fear, and I can't make a decision based off of that. You know, I won't be happy with myself if I do that. I'm just gonna take it one race at a time, and, and may, I can be done in May. I just said to myself, I can be done after Vegas, that, that's it. There's nothing more difficult than having that inner battle with yourself. You know, like I feel like 2017, you saw, a different Ryan. We lead, we're starting to throw away the lead now, we lose the lead, get it back, and it, we got one race left. And it gave me the motivation for that day to give it my all, whatever happened, win or lose, that this was gonna be it. I think the the real Ryan was, was playing it smart and he, consistency got the job done, and my hat's off to that. And there goes Dungey! There's the exclamation point, one way or the other! Tomac comes back, takes Dungey out of it! Supercross FIM World Champion for the fourth time in his career is Ryan Dungey. It was the craziest race of my life, but we won the championship and uh, it was good to be able to hang it up with that. At the end of the Vegas, when he came to me, he was, uh, it was a very emotional. A year ago, my dad passed away. So,
he uh, dedicate the championship to my dad. And uh, as we come down, we win the championship, the craziest night of racing. Here's Carlos, and he's giving me a big hug, and I said, that was for your dad. We started crying, you know, it was so cool. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's to me, that's, it's, I don't have any words to say. I mean, it's just, that's the moment uh, that he, he top it off. And I will say, thanks, Ryan. Here we are in 2012. Everybody says, you're crazy. This is, you know, career suicide. What are you doing? Six years later, and now KTM is the top manufacturer in motocross, supercross. It was one of the best things that ever could have happened to me. It's crazy, it's like it's bizarre for me, you know, here I am sitting here at 35 years old and Ryan's 27 and we're talking about his retirement, not mine. As a promoter, you have guys that don't get to choose their exit and it's heartbreaking. And you have guys that stick around too long and it's kind of disappointing. Ryan Dungey, the commitment that he raced with and the conviction in his voice when he said he was done, I mean, you could hear it, you could feel it and you were happy for him. And from the time he was number 142 on that RM250 to the time that he was number one in Las Vegas, he took his bow and uh, it was well earned. Like I said, my career's been way better than I could have ever dreamed of. You know, as a kid, I just wanted to race dirt bikes. Yeah, looking back, had no idea. He was gonna be a multi-supercross, motocross champion. Nobody expected him to be the next guy that comes out of amateur to get the factory contract and win races, you know? It's the New England Patriots drafting Tom Brady 199th. Who in the world would have thought that some kid from Minnesota was going to end up winning nine championships and retiring at 27 as one of the all-time greats? He was a defined hero for this era. You know what I mean? For kids coming up. You don't have to be a superstar at a super young age. You can blossom later in life, you know? So don't give up. To see somebody just work his way from nothing to the top of the sport, it's really something to uh, you know, be proud of. He proved that every man could be a champion if, if, if every man did the work. I think a lot of the competitors are going to realize just how much that guy brought to the table, how consistent he was. Ryan consistently was the guy that everybody could count on every Saturday. He had an impressive career, 30 plus Supercross wins, and this consistency was never a question. When you look at the records, how many podiums he finished in a row, how many races he won, I'm sorry, you don't win that for luck. His titles, he has nine of them in 11 years of racing, and that is, that is exceptional. He's a once in a generation rider. Everybody who's worked with him probably realizes that. Yeah, when I hear the name Ryan Dungey, one of the first things that comes to my mind is your perfect athlete. You know, doing things like showing up for the ESPYs and taking his clothes off and doing the body issue for ESPN, those calls don't come out of nowhere. You've got to do the footwork to get that done. When you needed someone, Ryan Dungey would show up. He knew what his role was as uh, one of the top athletes in the sport, because he knew in the whole big scheme of things, one day there might be a Wheaties box in it for him, and there it was. I think we all joked as kids, you know, that's gonna be us one day on the cover, and, uh, and it happened, and I was just unreal. But the, the bigger thing, it was bigger than me, it was big for the sport. I think the way he fitted in there as the champion, the clean cut guy, gosh, what a perfect model to have for the sport. Off the dirt bike, I always think about how humble of a guy he is, how nice he is, you know, the charity work that he does for St. Jude. Willing to do anything to help anybody, he'll give his own shirt off his back for you. He's been able to do a lot of things for a lot of people that have been very positive, and I feel like that's why he's here, you know? I don't think it's just about riding a motorcycle. I think it's about what he did with his motorcycle. That's what I think. I feel like if I look at my whole career, it was the best scenario how everything could have happened. Everything from the time I was a kid as an amateur till I make it a pro and, and how everything went. I'm one of the riders who was actually truly able to make a living doing what I loved. You know, just do my thing. Do what I do best and uh, it's riding.
and I can be done now and my family and my wife and all these other people worked really hard and, and now I can enjoy a little bit before we move on to that next chapter. So yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty dang cool. Ryan Dungey, as a journalist, as a fan, as a promoter, never let me down. You could always count on Ryan Dungey. I'm Ryan Dungey. Danger. <laughs> Actually, I love you doing. Uh, so, <laughs> so. And I'm Ryan Dungey's. <laughs> <Dungeons. sighs> okay, uh, let's see here. Let me get my notepad out here. Ryan is the kind of guy who gets like a catchphrase and just says it all the time. Hey, what's up, man? That used to be his go-to. Super pumped was way overused. Goldenrod, that was a bad idea. I and mean, I can't tell you how much crap he's taken for super dungy pumped. People don't really get to see the real Ryan like when the cameras and everything's gone. He's just like us, he'll go drink a six pack and likes to fish, like he's messes around and you know, he takes his clothes off and he'll jump on me like he, he's, He's just like any normal person, so. You know, if he gets a couple silver bullets in him, he's, if there's a karaoke machine, he's the first one taking a stab at it. And Me and Lens will be sitting on the couch, and next thing you know, he's walking out in his George Strait hat, George Strait boots and, and uh, jeans, and just starts singing. He's, he's obsessed with George Strait. It's all gotta come on in. Just, the relationship will just be different. Right, and hopefully that and get a free cup for your shorts from you. <laughs> so one of the funniest Ryan Dungey moments, and Ryan, don't get mad when I tell this. He asked my mom one time, my mom was fixing dinner, and he asked, what bird does a ham come from? Sorry, bud. Ham doesn't come from a bird. I'm pretty sure you know that now. <laughs>